Hey, everybody. Happy 3 o'clock. This is Dan from Happy Grasshopper. And uh, I'm going to, like, slowly turn down the volume here on my friend Paul McCartney. Oh, yeah. There we go. Bye, Paul. <laughs> Bye, Paul. So this is cool, everyone. I'm so excited to welcome you to the webinar. Now, you are seeing my screen and my buddy Greg's face right now. Say hi to everybody, Greg. Everybody. <laughs> so I'm going to turn on my camera here as well. You can see me. Hello. Hi. Happy Thursday. Happy webinar day. This is sincerely one of my favorite days ever because uh, we're about to have a super powerful conversation. Now, uh, there's a little bit of preamble here. I want to just get right to it today. So if you came to this webinar because you wanted to learn about Happy Grasshopper, you came to the wrong webinar. This is not a sales pitch for my services, nor Greg's. We are here to have a conversation that we have a very clear intent for, and that is to help you. That's it. That's it. Period. So there is no sales pitch attached to this webinar. This is not a tips and tricks training session. That is not what today is about. Today we're talking about the fundamental stuff that underpins all those sort of strategies and tactical things. Like, you know, as Gray and I were talking about earlier, there's a million things you could do. Uh, the challenge that we all face is it's hard to even get ourselves to do some things. Like, what is it that holds us back from even doing some of the very basic things that we know we should do uh, without being distracted to look at all the 11,000 other things that are possible for us? So um, I'm going to do a proper introduction here for Greg in just a moment. Uh, I thought it might be helpful for me to share with you why we're doing this. Like, why does Dan have an interest in this, right? Why does he bother to invite hundreds and hundreds of people to show up for an event like this? And the reason, like the fundamental reason that I've hosted these webinar sessions and, you know, the coaching conversation, this is a special session. Uh, I've done these with really powerful, smart people like Christy Belt Grossman and Diana Kokoska and Roberta Ross and Corey Bergeron and Ryan Tollison, Mark Ensign. These are all people who are succeeding at the very highest levels, and I've invited them to be part of your world. I've invited them to come here and share with you the things that, uh, that they do that are so unique and special and different. Um, I do that because I'm a person who's made a transition in my life. Uh, I was raised in an environment I did not like. I did not come from a great family. Uh, Well-educated, sure. Broken. Absolutely. <laughs> like, there was no certainty that I could ever uh, go on to achieve the sorts of things that I have. And uh, for absolute clarity, I'm not referring to monetary things or business things. I'm talking about the things that really matter. Like I fell in love when I was 19 years old, right? I got married at 25 and we're still super happily married. We've got three wonderful kids. I like travel around the world speaking. I cannot wait home. I cannot wait to get home to my wife and kids. That's that's not something I ever expected when I was a kid. Like that reality would never have occurred for me if it weren't for the intervention of people in my life that that saw a need in me that they could fill. So uh, hosting this sort of webinar series for me is about paying that forward, right? It's about bringing people in who I know can make a sincere difference and sharing those people with you, right? Because like we come to this webinar from all different places. Some of you uh, might really need our help right now, right? And others maybe are just curious. Wherever you're coming from, it's totally fine. There's something here for you. And, uh, and whatever it is you're here for, the questions box is open, right? So you can pop your questions in there. I'm gonna be keeping an eye on it the whole entire time throughout the webinar. And uh, like I see my buddy, Jolenta Averill. Hi, Jolenta. <laughs> I love that she's uh, commenting on my beard. Yeah, it's kind of young, you know, I'm, I'm giving it a try. So um, today, like every day at this stage in my life, I get to do some things I never expected to do. Uh, I get to literally go to places where I wouldn't even think they'd let people like me in, like to be invited to speak at Harvard or NASDAQ, like to travel around and speak to thousands of people every single year to me just feels like, what did I do to deserve this? 
Where did this come from? How did I get so lucky to, to get to have these experiences with people that I sincerely care about? And, and how is it that I get to come home to like live my dream? Like we've got a fantastic life. It's, it's working so much better than I ever thought it would be. And all of that that I've just shown you, that's like the very public stuff, right? So is this Dan saying, hey, doesn't he have all his shit together? And the answer is no, right? <laughs> so let me be very crystal clear with you. Just because there's those sorts of things that are real and are happening doesn't also mean that I don't have an inner voice that hates me, right? It doesn't mean that I don't have uh, self-doubts that creep in. It doesn't mean that I don't have a tough time peeling myself off the couch to do something I don't want to do. Like we all struggle with those issues no matter what level we're at, right? We do. It's a real thing. And that's why I've invited Greg here today because I want to have a very authentic conversation with him. I want to include you in that conversation. And I want to invite you to, to share in the questions box any sort of issue you might have, anything you want some input on. Uh, Greg is, is eminently qualified to share this. And, and this is the point where I'll start to do like the proper introduction for you, Greg, because I mean, you're such a neat guy. So uh, this month, Greg uh, is achieving a certification as a master NLP practitioner. And I know that even when I say the words NLP, like some people get confused, right? So um, before we go into uh, answering that question, what that is and what it's all about, uh, let me just tell you that uh, Greg is someone who has been in my life for, I'll say, maybe two years, two and a half years, something like that. And without fail, every conversation I've had with this man has been something that's caused me to go back and reflect. And, you know, the, the thing about coaching is that it doesn't do any good if it doesn't create that moment of introspection because learning doesn't happen in the moment you're absorbing stuff, right? Learning happens when you go back and you reflect on what it was that was presented, right? Uh, so Greg has a unique ability to cause people to think and, and that's why I invited him to, to join us today. So welcome, Greg, I'm so glad you're with us. Thank you, I'm really excited to be here too. It's um, These kinds of conversations are just so fun and so dynamic. and so appropriate for all of us um and like you dan i um i don't get my shit together either <laughs> all the time yeah. um and really uh i think part of our conversation today we'll be talking about like it's okay that it's not together all the time it's just not okay for us to stay in that mode and mm. uh, i think one of the most critical things that uh, i'd like people to be able to take from our conversation and all the different things we talk about is a great life is possible a great business is possible. Greatness is possible. Doesn't mean it's easy, but we'll talk about some things today. I think that'll just kind of help all of us be able to get there a little easier, a little faster, right? Yeah, Good. definitely. We'll dig into that. And, you know, part of the registration process, like everyone who's here knows, we have so many, uh, so many questions just from your registration. Uh, so many of you guys have taken the time already to enter some questions. So we're going to, we're going to dive into those things as well. But uh, I think everything we talk about today is going to be more effective if we can give people a little bit of an understanding of even what NLP is. Absolutely. So uh, please explain, Greg. Yeah. So um, let's start with the name. Um, NLP stands for Neuro Linguistic Programming. Sounds like a fancy term. And the reality is, is it sounds fancy because the, the two guys who, who, who came up with the, uh, the world of NLP were a linguist and a computer programmer. And so it's all about jargon, right, in, in, in those worlds. And um, uh, this is a time when the computer world was really kind of taken off in the 70s and so on and so forth. But what's interesting about the name neuro-linguistic programming is the word neuro really is in relation to our nervous system. And, mm -hmm. and probably a lot of our, uh, a lot of the, the, those of you here on the, on the webinar with us um, have an understanding that, you know, um, we all have a nervous system and it is uh, is the one place where we function from, uh, meaning we fun all the subconscious functions of our body, but also the functions of how we choose and show up and act in this world. And so, um, it's a little study about how that how that neurology works in the human person. The linguistics has to do with language. Now, Dan, I tell this to everybody, but I firmly believe that single number one most powerful skill a person can have in their life is the ability to communicate. I think sometimes we forget though 
that it's equally as important for us to be able to communicate with ourselves and our neurology as much as it is to communicate with others and the world right. around That's us. Internal communication as well as external. That's right. And so when you were you were, we were talking about my my ability to be able to help people think, that's really the the place where things happen. There is that, that our that our thoughts affect our neurology, which affect how our body and our and our, and our experiences of the life. And so language and the way we communicate things to ourselves and to the world uh, affects not only our neuro, neurology but how we experience our life. The last piece is a fancy term called programming, because again, this was this was you know by a computer uh, computer genius type of person, but. Um, Programming is just simply a process. It's a step-by-step -step on how something gets done. And the truth is, is that every single one of us has a step-by-step -step process that we go through to do or to have anything in our life. And I really mean anything. Mm -hmm. The interesting thing is that these processes happen so fast that um, we almost don't even know they exist. And right. so that's what I spent my time to, uh, learning about is how does the human person work, right? Because we can understand ourselves. Yeah, and that, like... So I'm going to jump in here a little bit because yeah, like one of the things that uh, that we've got to own up to is that NLP has been a term that's thrown around for a long time. And I think I think it's gotten a little bit of a bad rap. Right. Because there are a lot of people who feel like, "Ooh, I'm going to learn a few magic words and I'll just, you know, like create whatever reality I want. Um, like, you know, one of the questions was, how can I use NLP to convert leads more effectively? Right. And And that would be like you know, having a spell you can cast and, and just do that. And, yeah. um, you know, I want to take a moment to break that down because, yes, there's an aspect of NLP that's about using words that work. I mean, the words we choose do matter. It makes a big difference. But it, it's not like you're not casting a spell, right? That's not what this is. I know. And this is interesting because I think uh, part of what happens is with, with the, both the, the stuff we're after in life and the stuff that challenges us in life, we all wish that we had the magic wand, right? Nothing like being being our own little Harry Potter and going, you know, whatever the spell is and it's gone or it's or it's here or whatever that is. And so here's the truth of the matter is that there really isn't one. There's no magic pill. This is not the Matrix, <laughs> right? There's no magic wand. This is not yeah. Harry Potter. But there are things that really do work and there's a way things work. And this is really the core of what NLP is all about. Like mm -hmm. you said, a lot of people have heard it around language or scripting or sales or something like that. But the world is much more broad. And because there's a way things work, really the field of NLP has been a study and a modeling of the things that get the best results in whatever area somebody wants to be able to work on. And in doing so, it's left behind a trail of techniques that help people get there faster and easier. Right. Gotcha. Now, that's a really broad, but we can, we, can, well, we can have specific applications to that. Anything from sales to um, some of the original uh, people that um, that the founders of NLP modeled were therapists, some of the best in the world. And therapists, their job is to help people change. Mm -hmm. We need to, you know, uh, have have a need for change when we want something different than what we have. Right. Yeah. So NLP is really about modeling. Absolutely. So you know, like uh, like Tony Robbins would teach, if you want to be successful at something, find someone who's already successful at it, observe what it is that they're doing, model that behavior, and then adapt and really make it your own. Right. Right. And for some people, at least it did for me, when I, when I first heard Tony Robbins talking about that, I was like, geez, that sounds like a lot of work. That sounds like those guys who do research for a living, right? And that's not very interesting to me. And yet, one of my favorite parts about NLP is that there are a lot of people out there modeling other people, whether they know it or not, and they've already come up with good, uh, effective processes. And so really, sometimes it's a matter of learning some of the things that other people have modeled, and now you've got a quicker, faster way to be able to get there. This is why coaching can work so well for people. Right. Yeah, well, so let's let's talk about that. Um, I mean, I'm a guy who believes in coaching. I've had coaches for years. I, I'm going to continue to have coaches throughout my life because I know that I need help to bring out the best version of myself. Like, you know, and I know if I want to not smell bad, I need to bathe every day, right? Like, there's some things that I feel we just need as human beings, and this is one of them. So uh, I believe in coaching, but I know that not everyone does like and, yeah. and not, not everyone should because there's so many bad coaches out there. <laughs> like there's there's a huge difference between saying, uh, hey, I'm a coach and actually being prepared uh, to to bear the burden of the responsibility of helping people impact their lives. Right. Absolutely. Um, Absolutely. I uh, this is very interesting because when I became interested in the world of coaching as a as a formal um, career and vocation for myself, um, I took a good hard look at what was going on out there because 
I believe, and I've seen that coaching is not just simply, hey, my friends in high school always used to ask me for advice, therefore I'd make a good coach. It's, it's, it's right. more than that. It's not complicated, but it's more than that. And so I specifically sought out for my own kids, and if I really believed I was going to be helpful to anybody, that I needed to seek out a set of skills and as many as I could to have a tool belt that if somebody says, I need help with this, I had something to offer. That's mm -hmm. important to me because I really, really care about whether people make it or not. Right. And I think that's one of the key pieces of being a coach is not just be able to be able to charge somebody for for uh, for help, but also to be able to have a set of skills and ability and a character that can actually um, care about what some, whether somebody makes it or not. So I mean, I'm in agreement with you on that one. Well, you know, and I think there's different kinds of coaching, too. So not to get like too bogged down in the details here, but there's a difference between hiring like a, a real estate coach for example, who's going to help someone really like maybe master their listing presentation or nail lead gen or, you know, whatever it might need to be. And like a transformational life coach, like those are, there's elements that uh, are similar that they have in common, but there's, they're really, in my opinion, two entirely different things. Uh, absolutely. You agree with that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, interesting in the world of coaching is starting to become a little bit more niche, or niched, however you want to say that uh, now, because, there are people who are relationship coaches, but there are some people who who are only marriage coaches, right? They don't mm -hmm. they don't coach people in dating and so on and so forth. So you can get very niched in that in that industry. And I think yeah. part of it has to do is what is the interest of the coach, what they feel like they a want to do, and b what they they have the skill set to do. But on top of that, um, one of the reasons what I that I've done what I've done and studied what I've studied is because um, I, I believe in coaching to the whole person. Because when we uh, when we learn things like how to lead generate or how to be able to convert and those kinds of things, um, there's the knowledge of knowing how to do that, and then there's the actual doing it. And a mm -hmm. lot of times, what ends up happening is when people let me say it this way: um, your 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 life is your comfort zone, and everything you don't yet have in your life is outside of your comfort zone. And when some people start going after what they don't yet have, they reach the edge of the boundary of their comfort zone. And that's when stuff from the past comes up, right? Past experiences and failures and successes and yeah. those kinds of things as well. And that's a perfect time for us to start figuring out, okay, now this is what's getting in my way. I know how to do it, but for some reason, I'm not getting myself to do it. And that's one of my favorite pieces, to help unlock that piece so that people can take the action that gets them what they want. Mm -hmm. Okay, and so un unlock that piece so people can take the action. That's it. Right? Yeah, so that, I mean, that's like a key... That's a key series of words you put together there, right? Yep. Uh, I mean, because like, uh, I'll get just completely transparent, right? Because we can do this. We're all friends here. We can do this right. sort of thing. Like there have been times in my life where I have been uh, certain I needed to take an action and yet something was holding me back from that action. Like... You know, when I was a kid, maybe it was mowing the lawn or doing the dishes, right? And it was pretty obvious to know why I didn't want to do that action. Uh, but but as an adult, you know, there are things that I feel I really need to do that sometimes I, I shy away from doing. And internally, it feels like what's always holding me back there would be fear, right? So, you know, hey, I'm an entrepreneur, right? Uh you can't be self-employed without being comfortable with a certain amount of fear. And yet I'm surprised how frequently when I, I really examine what it is that's stopping me, it's things like uh, what other people might think, right? Or, or how this might change things in a way that's not expected. Like you can't always predict that, right? Yep. So I'll just give you an example. Like uh, as a, a tech company, we're constantly evaluating uh, packages we can present to the market, like combining this with that, what's the end result? Um, if we add these services to our base offering, does that create more confusion in the market, right? Or does it, it make us more of a must-have solution for people, right? Yeah. So there's, there are all those sorts of questions, and it's easy to get bogged down, right? Whether it's selling real estate or it's selling services, whatever it might be, uh, it's easy to get kind of trapped in that cycle. So I'm curious how you would coach someone out of that. Yeah, so this is really good. And thank you for this example because it's really ideal and all of us walk in this. So number one, hopefully everybody understands that we're all going to run up against interference and challenges in our lives. But what's interesting is that the way that we process information, what happens in the world, whether we're getting that information from our own self-talk or from external experiences and people, 
there's a process by which we handle that information. We either delete it, we distort it, or we generalize that information. And we have to do that because there's so much information coming at us at any one given time that if we really tried to take all that in, it would probably blow us apart. <laughs> okay. Right. And we can only handle small chunks of that at a time. And so in order to do, in order to have those chunks, we have to delete, distort, and generalize those into pieces. And so sometimes in our deleting and distorting and generalizing, we come up with meanings because we are makers of meaning. We come up with meanings um, that may or may not serve us well. So um, if you don't mind, I'm going to uh, poke around in one of the things you said was that in order to be an entrepreneur or self-employed type of person, you have to get comfortable with fear. And as a coach, I would actually challenge that because – Although Dan or anybody else might be getting something from that fear, um, doesn't necessarily mean it has to be there. And so maybe, yes, that as an entrepreneur, you have to get comfortable with some sort of risk, but risk doesn't have to be scary. Have to be scary, right. Yeah, so that's, that. that's a great and point. So sometimes we just make So this, this is a perfect example, right? Because, yeah. you know, I'm a person who's invested in coaching for a long period of time. Like personal development has been part of my life for more than 25 years. Awesome. Um, you know, and and yet, as I'm describing this to you, I'm stating that my sort of blueprint is that being an entrepreneur means being comfortable with a certain amount of fear. Right. right? And yep. and you called me on that. I love that. Yeah. No, that wasn't it. You know, uh, you just have to be the perfect example to be able to bring that up. But I, I share that because I want people to be able to realize that it's OK and it's actually perfectly good and, and uh, healthy for us to delete and store and generalize information. We mm -hmm. just have to say taking a look at the expiration date on some of our beliefs. Because some beliefs will take on and they may serve us, for a time, serve us for a time. But then eventually those rules wear out and their expiration date goes past due and they no longer help us or serve us. And that's when it's time for us to change the beliefs and the rules and the understandings um, around life and recircle back around the generalizations and the distortions mm -hmm. and the nations. Okay. So, so let's try to let's pull in the audience here a little bit i want to yeah. i would love for someone to volunteer a question they have or, or a place maybe where they're a little stuck and they could use greg's help and get him past that so um you know there's always a little delay here so we'll see as those are coming in and i'm going to jump into the um the document we have with uh, so many questions that people have already entered awesome. like let's let's go through and talk about some of these um so let's see. All right, so here are a couple of really tactical questions. Like, uh, while prospecting expires, FISBOs, uh, are there more effective words or power phrases you can win faster using NLP? Yeah, so this is a really good one. Um, and I'm glad you brought this one up because I, I did get a chance to pre-read some of these and this is fascinating and the answer in short, is yes, there are words that work better than other words. That's just how the nature of things. And we all know, we've all had either confusion or we'll call them arguments with mm -hmm. other individuals because of a, a, a misunderstanding of what the other person meant. And so one of the first things I would say, and it's honestly one of the presuppositions of NLP, is that the meaning of communication is the response you get. So if you're communicating with somebody like a prospect and the, the, the responses you're getting aren't ideal for helping them move forward or to getting a sale or something like that. We've got to be willing to change. And, um, and so that's part of the process. But um, uh, one of the things that, that's helpful is that every person has what we call a model of the world. We have a view because of our just deleting, distorting, and generalizing. We have a mm -hmm. view of how the world's supposed to work. And sometimes, and one of the best ways to be a good salesperson is to help match that model of the world, pace with people for a few minutes, and then lead them by by loosening their model of the world, by asking questions that make them think of something differently. Let me see if I have a, uh, a, uh, an example for you here. Um, for example, when you're talking with a for sale by owner, what's the most common thing that for sale, owners, for sale by owners say why they're selling on their own? Mm -hmm. It's usually because they want to save money. And so linguistically, I could really go down that road and say, well, you said that you wanted to save money. Isn't that true? And they'll say, yeah. Okay, well, let me ask you this. How much money will you lose by having to leave work so often so that you can show your home in a market where buyers are scrambling for a place to buy? It's, it's a literal reframe to help them think about that situation differently. They're trying to save money, but in fact, they may have to do all this extra marketing, leave work 
you know, which mm-hmm. costs them money and so on and so forth in order to be able to go show the home themselves. And then you can follow up with, doesn't it just make more sense to hire me so that I can handle all of that for you? I, I see the transition there. You met them where they were. You listened, right? You repeated back to them and then you modeled a, an outcome that matches their ultimate destination, right? Sure. Did I yeah. get that right? Yeah, and you, you start by acknowledging what they say because whether somebody's objecting or has questions of some sort, they're looking for a reason to say yes. We've gotta be able to understand that when people object to anything, whether it's in sales or it's just communication with your kids for that matter, right? they're looking for a reason to say yes to this stuff. People don't say no to their own dreams, but they've yeah. gotta believe that it's possible um, and um, that you're the one that's going to be able to help them get there. And so this right. is why we match where they're at and say, yeah, you said that was important to you and it's important to me too. So let me show you how it makes more sense financially. You know, you save more money by choosing to hire me because I handle all that for you. Does that make sense? Yeah. 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 I'm with you. I'm yeah. with you. Okay. Thank you. Um, so we're, we're getting questions that are coming in now and, and this Ooh. first one is really kind of touching. So, um, uh, this is from Doug. I, I won't be using last names, folks, so don't don't worry about this. This is a safe place. You can go ahead and ask whatever questions you want. And Doug writes that uh, his divorce has completely zapped his motivation. Mm. Uh, over the past three months, he's really been working on this, and it's coming back, and yet it's not where it needs to be. It, yeah. It's not where it was. It's not where it needs to be. So he'd like to know your thoughts on regenerating motivation and routine. Love it. I love it. Great question, Doug, because this is really at the heart of the matter. I mean, this is what we were talking about a minute ago, that things aren't functioning or I'm not, you know, doing certain types of things because of some things that have held up. And the first thing I want you to know, Doug, is that um, I have compassion for you around going through a situation like that. And it's important, first and foremost, for us to be able to recognize that that stuff is not fun, that it hurts, right? Because unless we can first take a look and say, you know what, this kind of sucks. Only then can we then take a look in, the, in a different direction and be able to say, okay, so what's next? Mm-hmm. So where I would go with this, number one is, um, in Doug, I know we haven't met before, and in, in, in a generous, um, having a generous sort of rapport is really helpful in this, but one of the things I like to ask people in this situation when they say, my divorce has done blank to me, is to ask them when they decided that. Because we really truly have the power to decide how something's going to affect us or not. It's important for us to remember that emotions are indicators, they're not dictators. They indicate that something's up and is unsettling in some way, shape or form possibly, or that something's great for that matter. But they're not a dictator that can determine the direction of your life unless you let it. My guess is, based on what he said right there, is that he's already realized that that at least at some subconscious level, And that's why he says it's getting better and he's moving in that direction. The other piece I want to encourage you with is that when it comes to, how do I say this? When it comes to feeling better, you literally can do that instantaneously. When it comes to having things be better, that takes time. And I want to encourage you, Doug, to be patient with yourself, to lean in on the things that are working, but then also get a real, uh, get a real clear, clear picture of what's next. And let me tell you what I mean by that. Um, in order to get things moving a little bit farther in a direction and to re-engage motivation, I want you to know that inspiration breeds motivation. What I mean by that is, what is the clear and compelling future that is a hell yes for you that makes you feel so fired up and so energized that you can't not take the action? You can't not move in the direction of that. Too often we have a tendency to want to run away from pain, like the flames of hell are licking at our asses. Right. And that gets us moving for a time until we get far enough from the flame that it doesn't burn anymore. But that doesn't keep us going. The thing that keeps us going is having something so clear and so desirable, like a white hot desire, that we we just end up moving in that direction. So, Doug, you're in a transition time. Be patient with yourself and yet start allowing yourself to dream a little again and figure out what is the next best thing going to look like for me since I'm not with that person anymore and that life's a little bit different. What's the next version of that going to look like for me that's going to get you excited? And then keep that picture in front of you, and it'll start driving you in the right direction. Other than that, I think you're doing some some right things. Good job. Doug, I had a conversation recently with my my best friend. Uh, Met in my junior year of high school. We have maintained our friendship all this time. 
And despite my appearance, it wasn't just a year or two ago. Um, so uh, he's the kind of guy who, you know, he knows me well enough to know exactly how I really am, whether or not I'm talking about it. And one of the things that happens in life, I think, especially for those of us who work in sales, right, or, or those of us in leadership positions, people ask us how things are and what do we say? They're great. Oh, they're awesome. Yeah, everything's fine. Everything's great. Wonderful. You know, we say that despite the fact that sometimes things aren't that way. And so when I was talking to my friend Rob, he said, you know, Dan, it's okay that you're not okay. Like, you can't be okay all the time. No one can. Yeah. And, you know, I just think that if there's a point in your life where you should forgive yourself for feeling a lack of motivation, it's probably around like a major life event like you've just experienced. And, you know, so I'd say uh, to just reiterate, like, you know, forgive yourself here a little bit. It's OK. You're not always going to be this way. That should be your expectation. And yet at least it's explainable. Right. Um if uh, you were finding yourself, you know, a, a complete lack for motivation without a justifiable reason, uh, that would be much more alarming, right? It'd be much more alarming. So I hope that helps. I hope that helps. Yeah. And um, uh, all right. So we'll see. We'll see. Uh, I'm going back through here. We'll look for some more questions. Uh, and, you know, Doug, any follow on there if you want to offer it, of course. You know, we're available there for that. So uh, next is uh, how can I set expectations with buyers and sellers so that I stop getting taken advantage of? Uh, Many people act like I'm their only client and I should be available 24-7. And I keep giving away services for free or way below market when I shouldn't be doing that. How can I stop myself from doing that? Love yeah, that question. That's a great question. Number one. Just like Dan said, forgive yourself for doing those things that are doing damage to you, okay? Secondly, let's talk about some strategy around this. Uh, the, the key way to be able, how do I say this? You teach people how to treat you. That's really what it is. And it's not just your words, it's your actions. And so by allowing yourself to give discounts and to be available 24 seven, you're teaching people that it's perfectly okay. And you, we, it's, I'm not saying you can't, but it's not helpful to be mad at other people for that because our actions told them that it was permissible for them to contact you at all hours or that they can get discounts and so well, on. So it's more than that, Greg, I have to jump in because in, in writing email campaigns for thousands and thousands of agents, wow. I can't tell you how many of them say, oh, well, tell them I'm available anytime. Right. Like, you know, call, text, email, whatever, 24-7, I'm here for you. That's and right. I think, all right, well, that's like totally surrendering. Yep. And then... You know, on the other hand, there are people where I might have a scheduled appointment with them. I call right on time and I get their voicemail and it says something like, I check voicemail at one o'clock and at five o'clock. And I think, is, I mean, can't there be a balance somewhere in between? Because, you know, if we have, uh, if we have the rug effect, like if we're just going to be available all the time, we're clearly surrendering our quality of life. And yet, you know, as someone who's hired real estate professionals, like I, it feels really not cool to have someone say uh, they check the email at one at, and at five and we'll get back to me then. So like, this, leads, this leads me to my next point, Dan, which I think is absolutely critical, is that in order for you to be able to prevent that from happening, you have to have standards. Mm -hmm. Like what is it that's non-negotiable for you and your business and your life and the way that you're going to use your time? Um, there's this powerful concept that I've learned from other coaches as well and I've applied it to my life that's been so amazing is the difference between effort and energy. Effort yeah. takes a lot more of our time and resources, right? We should only be giving effort to those who are a hell yes. Those are those who are the right client for us, which means you really do need to know who your avatar is. Who's your ideal client? market to that person, generate interest from that pe those people, and anybody yeah. who doesn't fit that model, it's okay to let them go. Because A, you'll be doing a good enough job to be able to get enough business, right? Which is, by the way, one of the common limiting beliefs in this industry is that if I'm not available 24 seven to people, um, I'm gonna lose business. It's just not true. Because every almost every other industry that in the world operates opposite. You know, if you- Yeah, you, you know, you got, you got I, 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 
I'm sorry, Greg. I want to invite someone in the audience who has that experience. Like agent, uh, agent who's out there hearing this right now, raise your hand for me if you're not available 24 seven and it's not hurting your business. Yeah, that's great. I want to hear that. That's great. Let's do that. And when we when we relate this to other other businesses, because business is business, we got a doctor's office. When you set an appointment with a doctor, it's probably not going to be at 10 p.m. at night in most cases. Does that make sense? Unless you go to the ER and those kinds of things. So they set their standards for how they operate. <laughs> yeah, that, it's a pet peeve for me because you know my time's valuable too, and if I don't get the first appointment of the day with my doctor, I don't I don't make the appointment. Like I'll wait an extra month to see the doctor because I don't want to show up for a 10 a.m. appointment and still be waiting at 1130. Yep. Like, not cool. Yep. So it's interesting because there's standards on both sides. There's standards as the, the, the business and there's standards as a consumer. <laughs> okay. So Lorna, Lorna has uh, some feedback for us here. Right. Uh, she says she has a client who was a pain for 10 months, but finally sold and uh, she earned 10K, right? So it was a thousand a month. Uh, but she learned a lot about not being available. Like, so if you can dig into that a little bit more, like, was this person trying to, no, Lorna, yeah. uh, was this person trying to like talk to you at all hours of the day and night and you just said no and, and it worked out okay? Is it that easy? And um, to the asker of the first question, I see your name. It's just so unique that I don't want to betray your privacy here. By, uh, by stating it, but if you could chime in and give us a little more detail on what that specific action is for you that makes you feel like you're being taken advantage of. What is that experience that you're interpreting as when this happens, I'm being taken advantage of? Because I'm curious if that might just be the way you're defining it uh, or your self-talk about what that situation is. Uh, or if, yeah, clearly they shouldn't be showing up at your home at, you know, 11 p.m. Or like, is it a clear violation or is it an interpretation? Right. So, yeah, and, and I'm sure we'll get some answers here in a moment. It takes yeah. a little while to type. So I, I'm sorry I had thrown you off track there because I just couldn't wait to, to interrupt and ask that. Um, so, well, yeah. And only while they're typing, uh, I think it might be interesting to be able to talk about, if I mentioned it briefly, is like, I use the word avatar, but basically your ideal client, when you're clear who that is, um, and you're only pursuing those people, you can get really clear about who you're going to let in your world, which is effort. Otherwise, the rest of it's energy. So for example, if I know who my avatar is, and somebody's not quite there yet, and maybe they're 10 months out, whether I know it or I don't, they're either people who get my energy and attention now, or they're somebody I incubate for when it is time for me to give more energy and effort to that right. person more energy and effort to that particular person and situation. Now, that may make sense, it makes sense on a logical level, right? Um, but at the same time, we gotta put processes in place to make sure that we adhere to our own standards. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, Margaret has uh, commented that she thinks it depends on the client. Like, you know, different time zones, for example, right? I just talked to uh, a member, I guess it was yesterday, uh, who has clients in, uh, New York and in Canada that are looking at property in Florida. And so she's busy with a, you know, a video camera grabbing video of the property down south here that that uh, they're, you know, pursuing a contract for. Um, so, you know, stuff like that to me doesn't feel like she's being taken advantage of. It feels like she's meeting the situations where her clients are. And sure, there are plenty of pictures online, but this is a little different. Like they've got questions about things. So she's she's serving them. Uh, Margaret also says, otherwise she's not available after 7.30 p.m. So like, that's a hard stop. Yeah, and, yeah. you know, I will say, I haven't uh, purchased a home in, I guess it's a little over six years now. And uh, when we bought our horse farm, the market was still really soft here in Tampa. And we bought at, at pretty much the low of the market. And it was a bank owned property. So it wasn't a typical like buyer seller negotiation kind of situation. And um, there wasn't really much need for me to, to bother my agent outside of normal business hours. Um, it wouldn't occur to me 
as a consumer to bother my agent outside of normal business hours. And yet, um, probably, what, two years ago, I sold a commercial property. And my commercial agent was happy to, like, text me at 10 o'clock if he got a reply, right? So I think sometimes it could be our behavior in that regard um, where we're setting an expectation because clearly if he's texting me at 10 p.m., there are no boundaries. Like, I can text him whenever. Right. So we have some uh, some more challenges that have been mentioned here. So I want to make sure we get to those. Uh, David writes that he's challenged with prospects who will set an appointment and then not show and not return calls. Mm-hmm. Um, and I'm not sure I understand this part. He says have to decide when they disqualify themselves. Uh, maybe they had an emergency slash or super busy. So, OK, I get it now. Yeah. Um, and this is kind of an interesting thing because. Um, like here at Happy Grasshopper, we have scheduled appointments with people that um, we keep all the metrics on. And we we run about a 66% kept ratio. So, you know, I don't know what yours are, David, but our clients are primarily real estate professionals. And I feel like because of the industry that we serve, that's reasonable. Like if I have an appointment booked with you and you have someone call and say, hey, I'd like you to come um, negotiate this deal or have a listing appointment or go show a home, whatever it might be, that's understandable to me. Um, less so if you've booked an appointment with them to make a listing presentation and they're not there for you. So again, to reiterate, he's challenged with prospects who set an appointment and then not show, not return calls. And he he needs to decide at what point they disqualify themselves from getting to be his client. What are your thoughts, Greg? This is good. Um, I'm reminded that Maya Angelou said, when people tell you who and how they are, believe them the first time. Now, I say that as a a self-protection, meaning that we have to remember that we can't control other people's behaviors. We can only influence them. And so putting some pieces in place that, A, how are – how you are actually scheduling an appointment with somebody um, and that your, your dialogue and your expectation is such that, hey, I'm going to schedule this appointment with you. and I just need to know for sure this is going to work for you and that you're going to be there. Is that true? And there's no reason you can't ask somebody to make a commitment because if they're not ready to make a commitment, then at least you're not wasting your time. Okay. Now, mm-hmm. if they're not ready to make a commitment, um, then, uh, then, then, you've, then you've got the incubation process where you follow up until they are ready. So don't let go of people and just say, screw you. I'm, I'm done with you. Because that's one of the things that happens is people get abandoned too easily in this business. And if I don't can't, if I can't get them to close with me right now, um, yeah. then forget it. But statistics show us that it's somewhere between eight and 12 times of being in touch with somebody before they'll actually confirm and you'll close the person either on an appointment or on a deal or a, a sale or something like that. So you got to recognize those numbers and be okay with the fact that that's just the reality of how things are. Just like at Happy Grasshopper, we have to be able to realize that, you know, 34% of people are just not going to show up, right? Yeah. Okay, so it's having well, we, we plan for it. We expect it. So that's right. And then what I encourage you to do too is have a follow up, something like the day before, or something like that. Says, "Hey, really looking forward, really looking mm-hmm. forward to having our conversation tomorrow, which is more likely that less likely for them to cancel last minute." Okay. Yeah. Um, and then, uh, and then um, you got to give them a clear and compelling reason to go. God, I got to make this appointment. <laughs> I've got to be there. Got to do is it. I'm really good at selling yourself. Yeah. Why do I want to meet with this person? So this this is a place where um, I want to pull in another little outside resource here. Uh, there's a, a company that we're friendly with called Sixth Division. Uh, they are really tightly embedded with Infusionsoft, and they help small businesses work on lots of automation sequences. And uh, we're we're both members of a group called Board of Advisors. So we get together and we talk about you know what are we doing, what are the issues. Uh, it's a place where you just go and you're like, oh, <laughs> help, right? Yeah. And so I went to them with my 66% and I said, oh, help. And they said, wow, your numbers are really like far off what they could be. Uh, we're running a 92% kept ratio for our appointments. And I thought, oh my gosh, well, I need to jump all over that. What are they doing? Yeah. And they walked me through their follow-up sequence, like what happens when someone registers and, you know, they, like at the time it's scheduled, uh, day before, right, day of, the, the whole thing. And it wasn't really super different from our own, right? And so we, we both kind of had that moment and we went, 
you know what, this isn't something that process can necessarily fix. It's something related to just the reality of the industry that we serve. Right. So, you know, if you have a listing appointment and someone's ghosting you on it, well, maybe they just wanted a CMA and they're hoping you'll just email it to them. I mean, who knows? I don't know. Yeah. I track the metrics and I, I take a look at that. And we have a ton of questions coming in now. Cool. So Let's go. it is 345. We have 15 minutes of this scheduled left. Uh, if you're loving this, the, the Q&A portion, and you think this is something we should do on a, a more regular basis, let me know in the chat. I want to see that for sure. Now, we're going to jump back to the question about uh, the person whose time is being wasted, being treated like a doormat, because they've added more comments here that I, I want to jump into. So one of the examples that she gives is she's losing a ton of time staging properties with her own stuff. It's bonkers. It's like a sickness. She enjoys doing it and she's great at it, right? And yet she's roping herself into a lot of these extra work, all these services, when she shouldn't be offering to do it at all, uh, let alone doing it for free. And uh, she says this, and I think this is key. I don't know how to stop this behavior. Mm -hmm. I see a need, sometimes unexpectedly, and uh, I volunteer, right? <laughs> and I'm like, oh my God, I just volunteered for that. <laughs> like she's shocked and dismayed to have seen herself volunteer. Yeah. So how does she break that pattern? So number one is you gotta remember that you do have options. <laughs> and what I mean by that is that it feels like I'm stuck and I can't stop myself. And yet you do have choices uh, and it's just a matter of discovering what those choices are. What else could I do instead? So I'm gonna throw out a couple of ideas here. Number one mm -hmm. is the, one of my favorite things about being in business in any type of business is to be able to start thinking around automating, delegating and eliminating. So could the state, if you want the staging process to be part of your services that sets you apart from other agents that don't do that, you can still have that. It just doesn't have to be you that does it. Or if you really love it that much where you do want to do that piece, then who else can you leverage or what systems can you leverage that will take care of the other pieces of business that are using up your time so you can have the time to do the staging piece. The beautiful part is you get to decide what you do and don't do. You get to decide what you want to do and what you don't want to do. It's just that if, they're, if it's causing a conflict, you've got to figure out a way, at least from a business standpoint, to either automate it, delegate it, or eliminate it such that uh, it frees you up your time. This goes back to that effort versus energy piece. But um, I would say don't be afraid to automate some of those kinds of pieces so that you can create the time for whichever piece you really want to make happen. Or you just eliminate it altogether. Is, is there a fourth door where she owns this? And, and she makes it part of her marketing package such that she stands out head and shoulders above any other listing agent in her market. That's exactly and, what I mean. Like she's got a, a talent for this to the extent she can't stop herself from exercising her talent. Like I have a friend who's a brilliant, brilliant musician and he can't walk into a room with an instrument and not like want to play it. Right. So I'm picturing her walking into a home and going, oh, I've got some furniture that would look great right there. That would sell this house so much more easily. Right. Right. Yeah. No, I think that's actually really the point I'm making there is that um, in an industry where, every, where the consumer constantly feels like every real estate agent is the same, differentiation is critical in any business, but especially in real estate. And so if you want to differentiate yourself, differentiate yourself by offering a staging service and even to the point where it's, I'm not even going to charge you extra for it. Now what it does is it can increase the likelihood of you, you being able to gain more clientele. You just have to be able to figure out what are the processes by which I'm going to be able to do that and automate right. some of that so that you yeah. can get and, and for what it's worth, more than one person is jumping in the chat to shout, charge for it, <laughs> charge for it, <laughs> charge for it. So, yeah, I, you know, that's always an option too. Now, um, there's a, a question here from a, a different David. I think this is a really good question. Uh, what resources or study methods would you recommend for someone wanting to apply NLP to their own lives? Are there support groups? <laughs> like, how do is there a community? How do people engage and get good at this stuff? Yeah, that's good. Um, actually, if you go, if you go to Facebook, there's some Facebook groups out there that are practice groups and or discussion groups where they'll talk about some of the concepts back and forth, or somebody might say, hey, I was working with this person, and this is the challenge I can't, and then people will just respond with resolutions on that kind of stuff. And so that's a really helpful way to be able to learn from other people. Um, let's see. Uh, there is a book out there, the Dummies books, you know, uh, NLP for Dummies. 
It's actually a really good overview of NLP in general. I mean, it's not going to give you all the details of how to be able to do all the pieces of NLP, which you may not need anyway, but it can give you a really good overall understanding of how NLP works and how to apply it. And so that's a resource I would recommend as well. Um, and then honestly, don't be afraid to go to an NLP training. It's uh, The good ones are like about seven days long uh, mm -hmm. with some really good people. And uh, you go to an NLP training. And I've known, uh, actually, some of the people that are some, some good friends of mine, uh, I met at one of my first NLP trainings. And they're all real estate agents. But they went, they got, they went through the training just to have the training or some of them got certified. Yeah. It doesn't really matter. But now you've got a good understanding of how to be able to use it. You can apply it to your life and your world. So, Greg, back in the 90s, I'm working as a sales rep for corporate America, right? GTE directories, people. I'm selling yellow pages ads. That's how old I am. And uh, it was actually an amazing time of my life. I learned a tremendous amount. I worked with a great group of people. And that's where I got uh, infected with the need to be an entrepreneur because all my clients, of course, were business owners. And uh, long story short, they invested heavily in training for us. And I don't remember what course it was, but that was the first time I heard NLP. And they passed out rubber bands. And, you know, if we had a negative thought, we were supposed to, like, snap our own wrist with the, the rubber band. Is that sort of thing still practiced? Is that? Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah, sure. Um, this is this is actually circles around the concept of triggers. Mm -hmm. So sometimes, uh, like, if you were to imagine a banana split, it might trigger your saliva glands to start watering a little bit, right? But we can get triggered by just about anything, positively and negatively. And so oftentimes, when we're having a negative thought to snap ourselves, it sends a message to our neurology because we feel a little bit of a sting to kind of go, um, I'm interrupting that pattern right now. And that's right. really what it is, is. We go down a pattern of certain thoughts and so on, and we're just interrupting that yeah. pattern. This, ha this can happen with even that behavior of staging homes. You just got to mm -hmm. find a way to interrupt the pattern. Um, and when you do that, um, it's effectual. So there's there's almost an unlimited number of ways to interrupt a pattern and, and uh, uh, fix a trigger. Okay. So I had a very interesting conversation with a friend of mine named Larry Yatch. So um, Larry is a retired Navy SEAL. Like, he's a badass. Yeah. Officially. Like, I mean, he's, a, he's an amazing guy. And he and I had this really deep conversation where he talked about how uh, neural pathways exist in the brain. Uh, and how they're created and like the example he gave comes to mind here um, like you know you think of being a child and you don't know the stove can burn you right so you touch the hot stove and oh you have a burn now on your hand right well when we experience trauma as Larry explained we're getting a very real burn but it's not on our hand it's in our neural pathways right sure. and and like right now uh, depending on your age, there are things that are seared in your neural pathways, like uh, when the Challenger exploded, 9-11, yeah. um, JFK, like there are these cultural moments where almost everyone can tell you exactly where they are and what they were doing and what they were wearing. And like, I remember being a kid at the roller rink and the guy came on and said that President Reagan was shot. And yeah. I was like, oh my gosh, wow, what does that mean? Like, you know, I remember the song that was playing when that happened, like bizarre, right? I was maybe 10 years old. I had no, no political awareness whatsoever, but I remember that moment. And so when we're talking about breaking a pattern, right, we've got that carved deep neural pathway and we've got to interrupt it. And, and so that's what the snap on the wrist is for. Yes. So this is very interesting because what you're talking about, um, they call them significant emotional events, S-E-E. -E. And when there's an event that happens and it has a very significant um, emotional reaction to it, mm -hmm. um, that gets locked in our neural pathways in a much stronger way than something else. So for example, um, seven days ago when I went out to check my mail, I don't really remember going out there to check the mail. I don't remember what was in the mail, anything like that. However, if there were to have been, you know, Publishers Clearinghouse told me I won a several million dollars, that would have upped the emotional attachment to that. And so that's what really what locks things into our emotional pathways or I mean our neural pathways. The other thing that's important to know is that those we're literally physically changing the brain. We're actually creating a physical strand of neurology in the brain. But what happens is those get so strong over time. This is why it feels like it's hard to break a habit. And this is, uh, this is why it's important to know that habits, old habits never die. They must be replaced. 
And so uh, it's basically starving that old neural pathway and building a new one in, in its place. And so when you snap the wrist or thing, it's basically interrupting that that pattern, that that strand of that neural pathway that's so fat and strong, um, and replacing it with something else. And so the more times you do that, you get a stronger pathway on positive thinking, and yeah. the other one atrophies. And that's really how you break habits and, and, and create new ones. Interesting. And, and the yeah. world of NLP has just found a ways to be able to do that much quicker, much simpler. And that's that's why I do what I do. Right. Okay. So. Uh, I get, again, I, it's like we're all walking around, we're experiencing things, we're interpreting the world, and and we're trying to understand how things are based on our experience of those things, right? So uh, when I hear you say this, I have to like immediately go, well, what is that like for me? What is the example in my life of where that thing occurred? And I'll tell you, there was... Um, like I lost uh, 30 pounds recently, you know, probably it's been a little over a year now. And it, it wasn't something that, um, it wasn't something where I was like, oh my God, I got a bad checkup, I've got to do this. It was a point where I reached a tipping point and I was just tired of the way things were to the extent that it was stronger than the desire to keep overeating. That's right. Like, you know, so, Using that as an example, I like to think of, well, you know, maybe I'm happy not making the number of prospecting calls I should. Like maybe I'm happy not really practicing my listing presentation. Yep. Uh, maybe I'm okay with the way things are until suddenly I'm not. Yep. And I'm, I'm really interested if NLP can provide a path to arriving at those moments more quickly. Like Absolutely. I would have loved to drop the weight a long time ago. It just wasn't important enough to me to do it. So how do we develop that sense of urgency and importance to actually uh, affect the change? So uh, you bring up a really interesting point. That's in a critical one. It's uh, You called it tipping point or threshold. Like I'm finally tired of the way things have been and I want something different. Like the pain is, <laughs> it's so uncomfortable that I can't not do something moving forward. There's there's two ways to get yourself there. One is just to finally get fed up after years and years and years of the same kind of stuff. And you're just like, this is changing. My father quit smoking this way. He just finally decided that he didn't like how things were, how he smelled and, and how his wife responded to it and all that kind of stuff. He finally just said, I'm done. And he literally quit cold turkey, right? People think it's, think, people think it's hard to quit smoking and it's really not that hard. Now, that's one way to be able to do it. The other way Smokers, is- Smokers, what do you think? <laughs> What's that? I wonder if we have smokers on the line who would disagree with that. Oh, I'm sure there would be. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then, uh, and then, and then you just have to, there's great understanding with that uh, around that piece that we could share at some other point in time. But when you look at the flip side of this too, there's threshold that I get sick of this. There mm -hmm. also can be that pull from the compelling future that we've talked about before. In terms of a process, um, one that I can think of right now is a technique called mapping across. When you're taking a situation or a circumstance or a state in your life that was positive and great and being able to transfer that into an area of your life that's not so comfortable or not so great. Um, and we do this at a, at a subconscious level where we were working with basically the, the pictures, the sounds and the emotions that are surrounding particular states or particular events and be able to transfer one to another, transfer a positive one onto the negative one. And it'll actually be represented in our brain and in our neurology in the way that the old positive thing was and so now it becomes something completely different in us. Does it making sense? And it's, it a process making that, sense. it's a process that can take anywhere between five and 20 minutes. Just got to like get in there and interrupt, interrupt the pathways. Um, I mean, it. so here's the thing, right? Like there's no substitute for a private conversation with someone who really knows this stuff. Um, there just isn't. So I love the fact that so many of you are here and, and you've taken some time out of your day to ask these questions and to engage with Greg. Um, I, I would encourage any of you, like I just put the link here in the chat, he's offered his time. So uh, his calendar is there in the chat. If you'd like to connect with him, you can use it uh, to do that. Um, I'm looking at the clock, it's like 3.59. I always try to be like super respectful of when we start and when we stop. Uh, sure. That's you know part of my commitment to the audience. So I want everyone to know what they can expect. And um, you so know, Dan, there are there are still a, like, Randy's asking, is there a recording, can I watch? Yes, I recorded it, I'll definitely send it to you. 
And you know what? I'd, I'd love it, folks, if you can just chime in here quick before we wrap up for the day. How awesome was this? Did you get a lot out of this? Would you love for us to have more of these sessions where it's just pure Q&A? You just bring your stuff and, and we do our best to answer it? Uh, if so, let me know here in the chat. Dan, so, while, they're, right. while they're offering that in the chat, I want to throw out one other thing because um, as you said, I'm offering my time and you can go to my calendar and schedule some time with me. Here's my, here's my favor that I'm asking of you. Please only schedule time with me if you're serious about your success and you really want to talk about how to make things different for yourself. Yeah. This is an example of, and it says this in, in, in the link that you go to, but, but this is me, an example of me being able to say to people, hey, if you're going to set an appointment with me, make sure that's something you're going to show up to. Just like right. you guys want to be able to do that for yourselves. And so I'm all in. I love having these conversations. So anytime, anytime. Yeah, I mean, there's an aspect, I think, for Greg where uh, kind of like the person who stages the homes, like when you have the ability to help, you just want to help as many people as you can. And that was our pre-chat here before we started uh, the idea of even having a session together. It was our alignment in just wanting to help. Like my motivation is to pay forward whatever I have, whatever I can to help other people. And Greg's is very much aligned with that. So uh, Greg, thank you. I sincerely appreciate what you shared with everyone today. It's been really great to have you. Well, it's been, a, it's blessed my socks off to be able to be here today and to share as much as I can. And I also want to let, uh, let you guys know that I've been part of this conversation that um, I want to thank you for trusting me and Dan. Uh, some of the conversation has been very personal and it, always very, very important. So thank you for trusting me and know that I'm cheering you guys on in a big way. Okay. Awesome. Cool. So, I mean, I'm seeing it like one after another. People are saying, do this again, do this again. Yes, do more. This was great. Very valuable. Go, go, go. <laughs> so awesome. I love to see that. I love that you guys got a lot out of today and, and uh, I'll get with Greg and see if we can schedule another session again soon. I'm um, all in. Cool. All right, everyone, thank you for your time and your attention. As always, I'm super grateful for you. Um, Greg, just again, thank you. Like, you're a special dude. Thank you for uh, sharing yourself with the world here. I, I definitely appreciate it. You're most welcome. All right, cool. See you. Bye, Bye everybody. everybody.